are finishing up Isaiah 59 this morning. Before we go into God's holy word, please pray with me. Father, we confess our sin. We confess our sin. We confess our need for you as a Savior. The only way to find forgiveness of our sins and to be made right with you is by your grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone your one and only Son, and the one and only way that you have made for us. Thank you for making a way for us. Thank you for your Holy Word, how you speak to us clearly, both back when it was written and today. It still stands as your holy, inerrant, all-sufficient Word. Give us wisdom and understanding of your Word so that we might better abide in it and be better ambassadors of it and of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. One quick thought, since I kind of triggered my, triggered my mind since I said ambassadors. You know, the church is almost like an embassy where it is sovereign soil, so to speak, right? And so we need to think of it that way. It's not something, it's, under, it's underneath God's sovereignty and underneath God's law, as well as, on a secondary note, governmental law. So we take our orders from God first and foremost, and as long as the governmental orders don't go against that, we work with them. Um, but if they do ever go against that, then we know who our loyalties lie with. We left off on verse 11 in Isaiah 59 last time. So we're on verse 12. Imagine that. Talking about confessing sin and admitting guilt. Something that even as believers, we do all the time, daily. Daily we admit our sin. Daily we confess our guilt. Daily we are repentant and seeking God. So verse 12 in Isaiah 59 says, For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities. Transgressing and denying the Lord and turning back from following our God. Speaking oppression and revolt. Conceiving and uttering from the heart lying words. Justice is turned back. Righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. If we stop there and, and just look at what we just read in those few verses, talking about sin or transgression, same thing. A transgression is a sin, and a sin is a transgression against a holy God. Here Isaiah is giving the answer. Remember last time we talked about how Israel and Judah are saying, God, we don't get it. We're, we're asking you for help. We're praying to you, but you're not listening. You're not answering. Perhaps you're not strong enough. Or perhaps your ear isn't close enough to us and you're, you're just missing. Or your arm's not long enough or strong enough to reach and help us. But that wasn't why God wasn't listening. That's not why God wasn't answering their prayers. God wasn't listening and answering their prayers because they're sinners. And not just believing uh, people who have committed a sin and repent of it. No, these are people who are openly choosing their own path, their own selves, and their own will over God's will. These aren't believers. These are people who are openly transgressing against God. They're doing all these rituals, all these ceremonies, on the outside to the eye, to the, to the human eye, it looks like they're going through all the rituals and all the ceremonies. So why God should be answering them to, is what the world would think. Look at all the motions they're going through. God should be answering them, but God doesn't answer them because God sees to the heart. God knows that what they're doing, they're not doing for him or because of him. They're doing it for themselves, at the core of what they're doing is a selfish intent, a selfish motivation. It's not motivated out of love for God or reverence or wanting to glorify and worship Him and do His will instead of our own. No, instead it's just, well, if I do this, then hopefully God will do that for me. They're not really seeking God's will, they're seeking their own will. And that's shown by their sinfulness, shown by their transgressions, a habitual, mar marked lifestyle of sin and disobedience. That's why God's not answering them. Because of the presence of, of willful, unrepentant sin. Verse 15. Truth is lacking. 
He who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord sought, and it displeased him that there was no justice. God's people, those who follow God, who seek his will more than their own, who, try, who abide in his word, you're in a good place. They're in a good place. What Isaiah is doing, or what God is having Isaiah here, is giving a reality check. This is what things are. This is how it really is. Quit lying to yourself. Open your eyes. Realize that God's not answering your prayers because He can't hear you. And God's not answering your prayers because He's too weak to do so. He's not answering your prayers because your sins have separated you from God. That's the reality check that's being given here. He saw, verse 16, he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. The Lord sees that there's no justice. It displeases him. God's people cry out to God for justice. They cry out to God for salvation. God knows this all along. He's not surprised by our desire for justice and our desire for salvation. He's the one who allows us to feel that way. He sees that there's no man, no intercessor. <clears throat> Excuse me. No one among them is taking the role of getting things in the right position. No one is doing who, no one's leading the people in righteousness. No such person can be found. No such intercessor who would help God's people get right with God. Who would plead their case to God. We know who our intercessor is, don't we? We have the privilege of having no other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as our intercessor, he leads us in righteousness. He pleads our case. He pleads our case, which is His blood. His sacrifice on the cross for our sake. For the propitiation or payment of our sins. And then He gives us His righteousness. He is the perfect intercessor. But without Christ, God looks at the world and says, there's no intercessor, there's no one who can be found to help lead people to repentance and to God. Verse 17. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay. Wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies, to the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. People will worship the Lord. People who are going to be crushed and defeated by him will bow down and, and worship him as Lord. And those who have been saved by him will bow down and worship him as Lord. We who have been saved by him will have additional reason for worshiping him because he will have defeated all of our enemies, all of his enemies, by his power and by his salvation. When you have such an almighty, powerful king, conquering almighty king, you only have two options. You either submit to him or you rebel against him. There is no in-between. There is only one way to survive, and that is to submit to him. Such an overwhelming force. We are nothing. We can't fight against him. We don't have the strength, we don't have the resources, gather all of humanity from the beginning of time to the end of time and put us all together in one gigantic army and we would still not have the strength to oppose God's pinky. He is so far above us. 
It's ludicrous. When we start speaking in these terms, it, it, it seems like madness to stand against the one and only ancient of days, almighty God. But those are the only two options you have. You either submit to such an overwhelming force or you rebel against it. God waited and waited and waited for his people to turn to him. He waited and looked for someone to lead his people to repentance. Looked for an intercessor for mankind. There was no such person. God did it himself. God did it himself. That was his plan all along. We are saved from God, by God, for God. That was God's plan all along. The Lord did it and does it himself. That was God's plan. He did it through his intercessor, Jesus Christ. He put on righteousness as a breastplate, a helmet of salvation on his head. The Lord puts on his armor. He puts on his helmet. He's, no one else is going to fight for his people. The Lord will. No one else is going to step up and do what needs to be done. The Lord will. You notice the connection there, hopefully, between that and Ephesians. Talking about the armor of God, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation. Rings a bell, doesn't it? It's the armor of God. It belongs to him. When Paul is encouraging believers in Ephesians to put on the whole armor of God, <coughs> when he's encouraging believers to put on the whole armor of God in Ephesians, it's the armor of God. It's not the armor of Michael. It's not the armor of Sally. It's put on the whole armor of God. It's God's armor. It belongs to him. And he uses it. In doing so, in God putting on his armor and bringing forth his intercessor, Jesus Christ, there is a result, an end, end game, an end result that is terrific, wonderful, amazing, glorious. They will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. That speaks of God's ultimate victory. The world going to pot? Yes. Going to hell in a handbasket? Yes. But God's ultimate victory is assured. His ultimate glory is assured. He will have that ultimate victory, which we as believers who are putting our faith and trust in him, he is our king, the king of kings and the Lord's of Lord, Lord of lords. So we share in that victory with him. He accomplishes that victory on his own. Through his strength, he deserves all the glory, all the praise. And because of this, even his enemies will bow to him. Just like we who are so dependent and grateful for his salvation bow to him. God's enemies will never triumph over him. In a situation where it seems like evil is conquering God's good, it's only because God is allowing it. So he must have some good reason to allow it. Some purpose that we might not see in the moment. We must trust in him because God is unstoppable. Even though enemies come in like a flood, God is unstoppable. He can't be defeated. When he says stop, things stop. When he says that's it, I'm done, I'm defeating these enemies, they are defeated. So if God is allowing something to happen to you, it's not because his arm's not long enough, it's not because his ear is not in tune to what you're saying. If you're living a life that is desiring His righteousness, if you're a believer and you're not in unrepentant sin and God is still allowing think, something to happen that you would term bad in your life, there must be a reason then. Because you know that God is good and that all things happen for the good of those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose, Romans 8, 28. And you also know, according to what we're reading here in Isaiah 59, that God is always victorious, that no one can defeat Him. No one can assail him. So if both those things are true, if God is allowing, that if, then if something is happening in your life, it's because God is allowing it, not because he doesn't have the power to stop it. So then you seek his will as to why is he allowing this? Perhaps he's chastising me. 
correcting me like a loving parent corrects their child. Perhaps he's tempering my faith, making me stronger in my trust and faith in him. Either way, God gives us victory through him and through his son. Because of that, we are more than conquerors, like Paul tells us in Romans 8. Isaiah 59, verse 20. And a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, who turn from sin, declares the Lord. You hear that? And a redeemer will come to Zion. That's talking of Jesus Christ. To those in Jacob, Israel, who turn from their transgression, who turn from their sin, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. After speaking kind of in that third person way through Isaiah, God is speaking first person, right? The Redeemer. And a Redeemer will come to Zion. This is a a Kingsman Redeemer. This is mentioned in Leviticus 25. A Kingsman Redeemer. Someone who buys a fellow Israelite or a fellow person in your family or in your bloodline out of bondage, out of slavery. Sounds a lot like what Christ does for us doesn't it? There's so many things in the Old Testament that are foreshadowings of what Christ does for us. The Kingsman Redeemer was also someone who was responsible for avenging blood that was spilt or murder of a family member. You can read that if you're interested in Numbers 35. They were also responsible for buying back land that the family had forfeited. This is a redeemer in kind of a worldly sense. Foreshadowing the redeemer that Christ is in the spiritual sense. He's he's made to to be responsible to safeguard that person, that property, that family. Again, a physical representation of what Christ does spiritually. Who does that Redeemer come to in in this regard? To those who turn away from transgression. So God, through Isaiah, is using this example of a a physical Redeemer, right? This Kingsman Redeemer that the Israelites would would be familiar with because of what they've read in Numbers and Deuteronomy and Leviticus. They'd be familiar with a Redeemer, Oh, that's the guy who takes care of everything. Buys back the land that's been forfeited. He takes care of the widows. He takes care of anything that's... If there's been blood spilt in the family, he will avenge it. If somebody's bought as a slave, he will buy them back. So they... Oh, yeah, we get it. They would understand what a redeemer is in that physical sense to them. And now God is using that example in the spiritual sense. Those who turn from their sins, those who turn from their transgressions, They will have a Redeemer come to them. Now he's talking spiritually. He's talking about Christ, the Messiah. Such people can trust that Christ, the suffering servant, the Redeemer, will come to them. But he doesn't just, he comes to those who turn away from their sin and their transgressions, those who have been regenerated, those who have been, like, they have to be regenerated first to have the desire to want to turn from their sin which then leads to the faith. And so then God is saying that, look, those who are regenerate, those who want to turn from their sin and their transgression, such people will have a Redeemer come to them. It's the promise of Christ coming to everyone who desires to be done with their sin and their transgressions against God. This is a promise. Don't read over that. This is a This is a promise to Israel in the future, which Paul talks about in Romans 11. But this is also a promise to every believer, Jew and non-Jew alike. God mentions that this is his covenant 
Yeah, this is regarding the new covenant of being saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in God's Messiah alone, who is Jesus Christ, that Redeemer that we're talking about right now. My spirit who is upon you, my word, shall not depart from your mouth from this time on and forevermore. God's word endures, never fails. He crosses every T, dots every I. It will always be. Same with his spirit. His spirit will always be. It is abiding and enduring. God accomplishes his purposes, his divine will. He accomplishes those, those things through his word, through his spirit, and through the people that he regenerates and redeems through his spirit and his word. Pretty awesome. That's the end of the chapter. Please pray with me. Father, let us always seek to be turning from our transgressions and sins against you. Let us not hide anything from you. We can't hide anything from you anyway. We are fully known by you. So please help us to turn from sin and from selfish living. And instead, Lord, let us live redeemed lives, lives marked by your enduring spirit and by your enduring word within us, so that each day we become more and more Christ-like, and that each day, Lord, you make us better servants that are able to boldly and, and, and gracefully share your word, to share your gospel, to stand for truth and righteousness, to stand for you, making you are all in all. Lord, help us to do those things and help those who are not yet saved by you, Lord, to hear your warnings, to hear your calls for repentance. For those who seek to just use you, Lord, break them gently and help them to see their need for you more. They need you more than a cosmic genie to answer their prayers. They need you as their savior and redeemer and justifier, making them right with you so that the sin that we all do does not lead to their eternal death. Father, please help us all in these things, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to be reminded that God is with us. That's Jesus, Emmanuel. God is with us. He will be your shield. He will be your sword. He will be your refuge, your tower, your strength. He will be that shepherd that tenderly grasps you up in his hands and cradles you and cares for you. He will meet your every need if you put all of your faith and trust in him. You will find that he will always be faithful and true, even when we're not. He's such a good God. May he bless you and keep you and help you, ser help you to serve him well this week. God bless you. Go and serve your king.